Um, I think we can get started. Uh, hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Uh, I'm Sam, a community manager at WSO2, and I'm also one of the organizers of this meetup. Um, since this is an online meetup, we do have people uh, joining from the different parts of the ANZ region. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to say a few points before we get started. Um, so we will be recording this session and uploading the slides. Um, we'll send those across to you via the meetup group. Um, and also during the session, if you do want to ask questions, you can ask them via the chat. Um, try to keep yourself muted during the session so the speaker does not get disturbed. But of course, after the session, if you do, do want to have a discussion, then you can unmute yourself and speak to the speaker, other attendees or the organizers. Um, and we do encourage you to kind of have that open discussion. Uh, so that's it from me. We can um, get started. Uh, we have Fazlan uh, today with us who will be speaking about API management for GraphQL. Um, thank you so much, Fazlan, for uh, being here. Uh, over to you. Thanks. Right. Thanks, Anne. So uh, welcome, everybody uh, who have joined uh, from various places around the world, like especially from the ANZ region. So uh, today's meetup is going to be on uh, API management for GraphQL. So uh, a little bit about me. So I'm Fazlan Nazim. I'm an associate, associate technical lead uh, for WSO2. So I've been with the company for about five and a half years now. And uh, in total, I've been uh, uh, I've been in the industry for about uh, six, uh, six, six and a half years. So uh, my role at WSO2 is mainly uh, to work on the API manage analytics platform. So these days we are working on a, a cloud native API analytics platform. Uh, but I do get involved in various other features in the WC2 platform as well. So uh, I got the opportunity to work for uh, especially mentor the GraphQL related features in WC2 API manager that we have sh shipped so far from uh, 3.0 to 3.2 to release. And I do. Uh, I, I involved in other discussions related to GraphQL uh, within WC2 as well. So you can uh, find me uh, at uh, this Twitter handle if you wanna uh, follow me. Uh, please do. Right. So let's get started. So the agenda for the next uh, one hour uh, is uh, as follows. So we will be first doing an introduction to GraphQL. So this is assuming that uh, some of you who have joined uh, might not be very familiar with GraphQL. So uh, in order to set the stage for them, uh, for the upcoming topics, we thought of uh, giving an introduction uh, to GraphQL. And then we will uh, show a live GraphQL demo, uh, which is uh, publicly accessible over the internet. So we'll show how it works. And then we will uh, compare it with REST so that we can understand the advantages and disadvantages uh, over REST. And then we will look at what API management means. So, uh, and then we will look at what GraphQL API management means, like what's the difference between these two. And to uh, end up, we will have a Q&A session if you want to clarify anything related to the content. Okay. So what is GraphQL? So in simple terms, uh, it's a query language uh, plus a runtime invented to make uh, front-end development easy. So the, uh, uh, the emphasis here is to make front-end development easy. So this was uh, developed internally by Facebook in 2012. So if uh, any of you uh, who haven't heard this history about it, so Facebook was having a few issues related to their mobile applications in all, all of the mobile platforms. So they wanted a solution, uh, solution to this and a bunch of engineers got together and came up with this uh, cool, uh, way, uh, cool way to fetch uh, data from the server. So the, in, initially the newsfeed team of the Facebook uh, mobile application adopted this uh, and then they got uh, really successful results. So once uh, they saw the success, the, the rest of the teams in the, in the Facebook, uh, Facebook as well, they also adopted the same technology 
in order to do their uh, so client server communication. So uh, what the initial uh, GraphQL implementation was actually uh, more tailored towards Facebook's own problems. But uh, what the engineers realized was that the underlying idea behind this technology is uh, more powerful so that it can be generalized to uh, many organizations problems. So what they then did was they worked on a, a generalized version for about uh, three years from 2012 to 2015. And then they, uh, then they released a specification uh, and a reference, implementa re reference implementation. Uh, the reference implementation is actually in JavaScript. So this was released in 2015. So the specification actually does not mandate any programming language. So this means that uh, any programming language can be used to create GraphQL APIs. So uh, even though the Facebook team initially uh, released the reference implementation in JavaScript, the community, just after they open sourced it, the community got together and they uh, implemented uh, client and server implementations of GraphQL in various other languages. So uh, you could download, you could download uh, client, uh, GraphQL implementations in any language, Java, Go, or C, C Sharp. Uh, so uh, this makes actually uh, to, this makes uh, existing, existing systems to adapt GraphQL easily so, uh, so that uh, they can get the advantages of GraphQL as well. Right, so some of these organizations like large organizations like Airbnb, AWS, Facebook, GitHub, all of them got together and formed a foundation called the GraphQL Foundation. So some of these companies are already using GraphQL in their internal applications, uh, but uh, some have gone to the extent even to expose their public APIs, which, which is implemented in uh, GraphQL. So GraphQL APIs are typically served over HTTP via a single endpoint. Whereas if you compare it with REST, a REST API would have multiple resource endpoints. Uh, so in GraphQL, it's just the client has to know only about a single URL because all of the capabilities of the GraphQL API is exposed via this single uh, URL. And it's also protocol agnostic. So uh, in the previous statement, I said that it's a typical reserved HTTP, but the specification actually does not mandate a protocol as such. But uh, if you see the GraphQL implementations out there, uh, many of them, uh, majority of them are implemented in HTTP. So this is very similar to REST because uh, REST, even REST, uh, Roy Fielding's dissertation uh, does not say uh, does not mandate a specification there as well. But if you see the REST APIs out there, uh, majority of them must be implement in, implemented in HTTP. Uh, but uh, a primary difference that uh, I see is that uh, the absence of a specification in REST uh, has actually uh, introduced uh, quite a bit of ambiguity in the community. So people are still debating oh, what is REST and what is not REST. Uh, there is also a term called REST-like APIs. The uh, people call uh, the APIs which are uh, not actually RESTful, but uh, they call themselves a REST. So uh, this ambiguity is because uh, there is no specification in REST, but uh, in GraphQL, the specification actually clearly states uh, what GraphQL is. So I think that is an edge uh, what GraphQL has because of this specification. So the, the primary idea of GraphQL uh, lies around this uh, idea called ask what you need and get exactly that. So uh, most of the advantages in GraphQL uh, is associated with this idea. We will exactly see what this uh, means in the upcoming slides. Uh, so, right. 
So GraphQL is actually product centric technology. So, uh, so it, 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 all the features in GraphQL specification is actually driven by the needs of the front end engineers. So we even uh, saw in the previous slides that uh, this, the GraphQL was created to make front end development easier. So uh, this actually the, all this, all the things that are in the GraphQL specification are driven by front end engineers uh, requirements. So, right. GraphQL schema. So what you see on this uh, image, here is a GraphQL schema. So in this uh, schema, there are four types. You can see there are four type definitions. So a schema is a collection of type definitions. It could be four, it could be 50, or it could be 100. So once it's defined, uh, the, the client and server knows the contract. The client exactly knows what it can query from the server. So it can answer questions such as uh, what fields can be selected and what kind of objects they might return and what fields are available on those sub objects. So uh, the language which has been used to write this GraphQL schema is called the GraphQL schema definition language. Uh, if you see on the bottom, there is a type called query. So this is a special type out of this out of these four types. So there are uh, three other uh, there are three special types actually, which are query, mutation, and subscription. So query queries are used to fetch data from the server and mutations are used to create or modify server side data and subscriptions are used to uh, use for real time use cases we will see what each of them mean okay so this is an example of a graphql query so in this example i have invoked the github graphql api so if you see on the left I'm asking for the login, login username, the company I work for, and the number of repositories I have in my account. And if you see on the right, you see the response. You could see that the response actually contains only the information that the request asked for. Nothing less and no, nothing more. So this is what we meant when we say, when we said, ask what you need and get exactly that. So mutations, uh, mutations are used to create, update, and delete operations. So in this particular example, uh, a mutation is being used to create a person named name Ali, name with the name Alice and age 36. And once it's created, once the person is created, the mutation is asking for the ID of the user. If you see on the right, uh, it has, responded with the ID of the user. You could see that the mutation could have asked for uh, some other information as well, like name, uh, but it asked only for the ID and the server also responded only with the ID. Right, so subscriptions. So subscriptions are used for real-time up, real update use cases. It could be used for a chat application or a stock trading application. Uh, something uh, something which has a real time use case so in subscriptions a single request is followed by a stream of responses so if you take the http uh, 1.x spec uh, what uh, it, it just has a single request response model but uh, subscriptions uh, the way they have defined uh, a single request can be followed by a stream of responses so you actually need a protocol level support in order to implement GraphQL subscriptions. So uh, usually uh, these GraphQL subscriptions are created using uh, web sockets. There could be other protocols as well, but that is what we have seen uh, most of the time. So in uh, this example, a subscription is being created uh, for submit comment operation. 
and once uh, once a, sub, a com comment is submitted it is asking for the message of the comment so what it means is now once a client sends the subscription if there is, if there are comments which are being added on the server this particular client has to be notified so if you see this image you can see there is a client event uh, which is a mutation and the mutation is adding a submit comment so once a comment is added it will trigger the subscription so that the client who was interested in the subscription will be notified so now if there is another client also doing the same thing again uh, this subscript this subscription client will be notified we'll see this in action in the upcoming slides okay so uh, in order to uh, so we've just seen what uh, graphql is in theory right we saw what queries and mutations are and subscriptions are so in order to explain how uh, this works and demonstrate i've chosen a public graphql api which is uh, available uh, freely over the internet called snowtooth mountain graphql api so i've particularly ch uh, chosen this api because it uh, supports all three operations we, we talked about which are query mutations and uh, subscriptions because most of the graphql apis out there mostly they support only queries so uh, in this example uh, this uh, snow snow tooth uh, mountain is actually a uh, ski resort so in this ski resort there are chair lifts and trails so what you see on the left is a chair lift and uh, what you see on the right is a trail map so chair lifts are used to uh, transport people from one one point to another point uh, in a uh, so that they can be act, uh, so that they can access a particular trail so uh, in this example uh, assume that there is a uh, graphql api which the snow to mountain ski resort uses in order to fetch the statuses of the lifts the trails and which trails can be used which chair lifts can be used to access which trails so that is the story behind it so we will uh, go to the demo and see how this works so right now i have uh, I have uh, gone to this URL, snowtoothmoonhighway.com. So uh, once you go to this URL, uh, it will load this UI, which is called the Gra GraphQL Playground. So this is a tryout tool for GraphQL API. Some of you might have already seen. It's similar to GraphQL, uh, but this particular implementation is from Apollo. And uh, from this uh, tryout tool, there are various uh, options available. You have the doc docs. You could see the GraphQL scheme over here. So all these functionalities are available. Uh, but I would request uh, the attendees not to try out this API right now, because I'm not sure whether they, they, are, they have a throttling implementation, which uh, they would throttle if they get too many requests. So uh, once I finish with the demo, you could uh, try this out. So first of all, uh, I'm going to get the live status just give me a minute all right so there is a query called all lives and i'm going to get the name and status of all the lives available in the uh, ski resort so you could see the response has the name of the lift and the status of the uh, status of the lift. So some are in closed state and some are in open state. There is also uh, uh, one lift which is in cold state. Now let's try uh, try to see which which trails can be accessed from each of these lift. So could do trail access and then name so you could see now i've got the response 
where it says I could use the Astra Express lift in order to access these trails. And I could use this to access these trails and so on. Right, let's execute another query. So uh, in this, I'm gonna use a argument. So I'm gonna uh, try to fetch only the open lips. You can see now the response I've got has only the open opened lips. The closed ones are not in the response. Okay. Now, if you see the docs, you could see that it's separated into uh, queries, mutations, and subscriptions. So in mutation, we have an operation called set lift status, which means I could use this to either, uh, I could use it to change the status of one of these lifts. So I'm gonna use uh, this operation and try to change the, uh, uh, change the status of the lift. So in order to do that, I first need to fetch the ID of the lift as well. So I'm gonna do that, right. So let's say uh, I'm gonna, I need to close this particular lift uh, from open state to close state. So, so it's a mutation, so I have, so it's a mutation. And then I'm gonna set lift status. And it's our, the arguments are an ID. So the ID, I'm gonna use this. Status, I'm gonna set it to closed. And once it's set, I'm gonna ask for the name and status to return. I could see after the mutation was executed, I, uh, the lift status has been changed to closed. It was open before. Okay, now we have seen query and mutation. What we haven't seen is a subscription. In order to explain how a subscription works, I'm gonna copy this URL and uh, I'm gonna open it up in a new tab. Right, okay, so if we go to docs and see the subscriptions available, there is a subscription for lift status change. So what it means is, uh, if I execute a subscription for this operation, if any of the lift status are changed, it will be notified. So let's try to execute this subscription. So now you could see, I have executed and you could see there is a, a message here saying it's listening. Now let's go back to our mutation and change this from close to open again. Okay, now I have changed it from uh, close to open. Let's go and see the subscription. So you can see the subscription has got a response. It says is the na uh, name is Neptune Rope and the status is open. I'm gonna change it back to closed. Now you can see I've got another response. So this is how subscriptions work. A single request followed by a stream of responses. So actually this uh, behind the scenes, this is implemented using WebSockets. So that is why we are able to retrieve multiple responses from a single request. Okay, since we are done with the demo, let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so any GraphQL uh, talk or article is not complete if we do not compete uh, compare it with rest. So 
let's compare it with rest uh, in order to uh, understand the differences let's take a conceptual example where a social media app needs to display the name of the user uh, the titles of the post of that user and the names of the last three followers of that user so assume that the client already has access to the user's id now this is how it's done in rest you could say the rest client in the first uh, it, it first talks to the user's endpoint to fetch user details so you could see that the server has responded with the user details and in the second uh, second uh, request it talks to the post endpoint to fetch the post of the user so you could see the posts have been uh, uh, sent from the server and the third request mm -hmm. is to fetch the followers of the user so in order to achieve this use case the rest client actually had to send three requests over the network to fetch all the details that it wanted now let's see the same example in a graphql implementation in a graphql implementation you could see the same requirement can be achieved via a single request you could see the uh, if you see on the top that is the uh, query which the graphql client is sending it actually asks only for what it only what it needs it asks for the name the titles of the post and the last three followers and the graphql endpoint has responded with all those details nothing less and nothing more all right so now let's look at some strengths and challenges in graphql so the first one is no more overfitting and underfitting so in order to understand what these two terms mean let's go back to the rest example so if you see on this example particular example uh, the the requirement was actually only to display the name of the user but when it talked to the user's endpoint the api the backend has responded with more details than what the client actually wanted you could see there is the id the address and the birthday and the client was never interested in it so it means the client uh, client has overfetched data so this is what we mean by overfetching the so underfetching means a single endpoint's inability to provide all the data what the client needs so in this example the rest client had to talk to three different endpoints three di different network requests in order to fetch all the uh, data that it needs so this is an example of underfetching so graphql is actually a solution for both these uh, both these problems so it is actually useful for a mobile application scenario where it has to be operated in a, a constrained a network uh, constrained network then uh, rapid it enables rapid product iterations on the front end so usually in a rest api the client front end requirements needs to be communicated to the uh, back end engineers in order to uh, correctly match the expected data formats and all so this is okay uh, until uh, is just uh, one client or uh, several clients the api talks to but uh, if the client's requirements are constantly changing and also if uh, if there are lots of clients with diverse requirements it becomes difficult to uh, if it becomes difficult to pro provide all the requirements from the from a restful api so in a if it's a graphql api this becomes much easier and it enables this rapid production product iterations on the front end that is actually an advantage in graphql so insightful analytics on the back end so you would have seen that in a restful api uh, you could actually uh, get analytics per resource 
of per API or per resource. You could go up to the uh, level of resource. So you could see that a particular resource has been invoked 100 times per minute uh, and a particular resource uh, 50 times a minute. But when it comes to GraphQL, you could just go one step further because uh, it's not just the resource. Uh, it means in GraphQL context is the operation. It's not, the, not just the operation. You could go just one step further and see what fields they are interested in as well. So that actually gives insightful uh, metrics for the businesses to decide where, where to optimize their uh, backends. So that is uh, also an advantage in GraphQL. Also, it's a good uh, fit for complex system and microservices. So we are uh, seeing uh, with the microservices architecture where uh, lots of microservices are being bundled into a single API and being exposed into uh, the consumers. So uh, this is not just only microservices, there could be legacy systems, other uh, REST APIs or other types of APIs. So if, if uh, there is a plan to abstract away these services from a unified interface, a GraphQL API would be a great fit. Right, it's just not only advantages that we have in GraphQL, we, there, there are disadvantages or challenges, I would say as well. So uh, we have challenges in integrating existing monitoring systems with GraphQL. So why this is because in GraphQL, you could uh, see that even, a, even an error scenario responds, which responds with HTTP status 200. So only if you see the GraphQL uh, response body, you could, uh, you could identify that there has been an error. And it's not just that. Uh, GraphQL also supports this concept of partial success and partial failures. So you could ask for several, uh, several details in the query and your server could respond only with few and the rest in a uh, error scenario. So uh, existing monitoring systems are not yet, uh, most of the existing monitoring systems are not yet capable of doing this level of analysis. So we are seeing challenges in uh, that space uh, when it comes to GraphQL. So caching is complicated. So uh, this, this has been uh, discussed in many uh, articles related to GraphQL because in a regular uh, uh, resource-based uh, resource -based API, HTTP caching can be leveraged easily to avoid refetching unchanged data. But uh, since in GraphQL, it's just one single endpoint that we are exposing, uh, it becomes a little bit challenging uh, to get this level of caching support. So the server needs to do more processing. So we discussed that GraphQL's primary objective is to uh, make front-end development easier. So this actually has shifted the overall systems complexity towards the server. So if you, if, you, if you assume the complexity in REST is in the middle, now in GraphQL, the, the complexity has been shifted towards the server so that the server now has to do more processing than before. So we've uh, heard this term called uh, new solutions bring new problems as well. So similar to that, GraphQL uh, has its own uh, problem related to uh, attacks, security attacks. So if there, if there are no protection against these uh, GraphQL specific attacks, then it could mean that uh, your uh, ser service could disrupt at any time because of these attacks. We will see what these attacks are in the upcoming slides. Right. Okay, so we've seen that GraphQL is giving enormous power to the consumers. But as the saying goes, with great power comes great responsibility as well. So this is a deeply nested query in GraphQL. So uh, usually if your GraphQL schema has a circular relationship where 
most of the GraphQL schema might have. In that case, a query with infinite depth is a possibility. So what you see on this image, so this has a particular depth of eight. It means uh, the number of levels it goes to. But uh, if the GraphQL schema supports the circular relationship, it can go up to uh, an indefinite value. So Mo fails to uh, resolve on the back end means there is more processing to do in the back end as well. So assume a scenario where a client sends these kind of queries intentionally or unintentionally to the back end in a high frequency. So this could mean that your service, uh, service is in risk. So there needs to be some level of protection uh, in a, some level of protection to identify these kind of queries before you resolve it uh, on the back end. Uh, the next one is computationally expensive queries. So it's not just uh, the depth which matters because uh, there could be some fields or operations that are uh, computationally ex expensive to resolve as well. So your query might technically have a depth level of two or three, but the, the fields that it requests are computationally expensive. So uh, in these scenarios, if the client can send those kind of requests uh, repetitively in high frequency, that is also going to affect your service, uh, service availability. So this also needs to be protected uh, from before being executed on the back end. Right. So we uh, discussed what GraphQL is uh, and we compared it uh, slightly with REST. So it's not just, we, even though we just compare it with REST, there are various other API styles that we can choose. There's gRPC and uh, all other API styles. But uh, when it comes to a question such as which is better, uh, it's not easy to answer. So the uh, way to put it would be, uh, there is no universal best style to build an API, uh, but there is always a best style to build an API for your problem. So you have to understand uh, what, what is the problem that you're trying to solve, what are the system constraints you have associated with it, and then see what uh, each style of API has to offer. So you know, GraphQL is not here to solve all of the problems. Uh, it's actually, a, even though some people consider that it's going, it's, it's going to, uh, uh, it, it's going to kill rest. It's not the case. So it, it has been actually read, uh, it, it has been designed to coexist with rest, not, not just to replace rest. Right. Now we've discussed uh, GraphQL, we saw a live demo and uh, we compared it with REST. Now let's come to the topic of API management. So there could be some people who are familiar with API management uh, already. So uh, for the, uh, there could be some people who are already using API management products in their organizations where they work. Where, where they work. Uh, so let me give a brief introduction on what API management actually means. Right. So if we are hearing a noise, uh, if you could mute yourself. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so this is a. Uh, this is how, uh, what API management means. So let's assume that you have, uh, you, in your organization, you have multiple services. So your services could be implemented uh, in Java, uh, another service could be implemented in Go and so on, or all the services could be implemented in the same language, it doesn't matter. But when there are lots of services in an organization and these services needs to be exposed to the consumers, uh, it becomes a little bit uh, tough uh, when, when they have to implement these cross-cutting concerns. 
what I meant by cross-cutting concerns is like uh, authentication, authorization, rate limiting, analytics. So these are very important quality of services for the service. But if each service implement uh, implementers try to implement these by themselves, it's going to be hard to maintain. It's going to be repetitive. It's also going to be a waste of time. So what if there is a separate layer, a separate network layer, which carries out these tasks for you? irrespective of the language that your service has been uh, developed or the protocol that it talks. So this is what mainly API management is here to solve. So API management actually provides all the quality of services to your backend services so that the uh, developers of the services do not need to worry about those and they can just uh, uh, what they have to consider is only about the business uh, business use cases. So it's not just the quality of services associated with this quality of services. We have uh, various other advantages which these API management platforms bring. So if you see uh, the image on the left, you could see where the API management platform actually fits into your overall architecture. You could see that on the top, there are different clients who are trying to talk to uh, backend services with various protocols and data formats. And in the middle, you have the API management platform. So what it means is all the traffic from your clients will flow through the API management platform to reach the uh, your backend services. So uh, let's see what these API management platforms usually offer. The first thing is about API lifecycle management. So lives, just like your backend service would have a life cycle, it would be in, first it would be in the development stage, then it will go to testing, then it will uh, go into prototype and live and then maybe retired. So just like the backend service has a life, life cycle, an API will also have a life cycle associated with it. So an API management platform provides you the capability and features to in order to uh, transi uh, transition this state, transition the state of the APIs from one state to another. So uh, this is supported from all of the API management platforms out there. So that is one of the uh, uh, common features an API management platform provides. Then uh, security. Security in this context actually means authentication and authorization. So a particular client would be interested in authenticating via Auth2, or then another client would be interested in mutual TLS, or some other client would be interested in uh, basic authentication. So uh, an API management platform could provide all these authentication mechanisms so that only the authenticated traffic will flow, flow from the API management platform to your backend. So your backend services do not need to worry about authenticating the incoming traffic. And also authorization. So authorizations uh, are typically supported via Auth2 scopes, or uh, SACML policies, and so on. So API management platforms uh, usually support these kind of authorization capabilities as well. And the next part is transformation. Assume that you have a legacy application which only talks XML and you have a service which only talks JSON. And uh, now if you have a use case where you want to connect these two, an API management platform would be the uh, right place because you could do different kinds of transformation there. You could do XML to REST, you could add headers and all these transformation capabilities are typically provided by an API management platform. And next is the rate limiting functionality. So we've, uh, so any service, uh, any service that you implement, uh, no matter how many instances of the services are running, uh, we know that it has a max capacity that it can uh, serve. So if you uh, send more requests than the max capacity, then it means that the services availability is at risk. So an API management platform can be used in order to rate limit 
the traffic that's going to the back end. Using various combinations, it could be application-wise rate limiting, it could be uh, rate limiting per API, and so on. So all these combinations of rate limiting functionalities are typically provided by an API management platform. And then next is analytics. Analytics, we saw that uh, since, since all the traffic is now moving through the API management platform, the services don't, don't need to worry about uh, implementing any analytics uh, solutions because the API management platform actually knows which APIs were executed, from which applications were they, and which resources were executed, and who was the user, and all these kinds of metrics are available on the API management platform. So uh, typically an API management plat platform would give uh, you various uh, charts and widgets in order to show this data. And then uh, developer onboarding. So no matter how many services that you have in your organization, if you do not have a correct platform to list them down and provide the capability of trying out them, documentation, uh, all these features, then that, that would also mean that uh, it's hard for the consumers. So usually API management platforms provide a developer portal where uh, application developers, it could be it could be internal application developers, it could be external application developers. They could log in and see what are the APIs available and pick and choose the right ones and then uh, see how it's authenticated, read the documentation and then try them out. So these are uh, the most common features an API management platform will provide. So there are various vendors out there for, for API management. Some are open source, some can be run on premise, some are cloud only, some can be run, uh, run on uh, hybrid mode. So these different uh, vendors provide various capabilities. So uh, uh, it's actually important for an organization to consider an API management platform if they have a lot of services to manage. All right. Uh, now about GraphQL API management, which is uh, the main thing that we wanted to talk about. So why do we have to talk about GraphQL API management separately if we already talked about API management? So the reason here is that uh, if you take an API management product out there, which was released about three, three years ago, uh, which just supports REST APIs and didn't know anything about GraphQL APIs. So still that API management product could be used to expose this GraphQL API. Because technically, a GraphQL API is still, a, still an HTTP endpoint. So it could be considered as a single resource REST API as well. So uh, technically, by, by using those, uh, even an old API management platform, you could still manage a GraphQL API. But what we are trying to point out here is that it is not enough for uh, GraphQL API management because you will lose out a lot of capabilities if your API management platform does not consider GraphQL APIs characteristics separately in order to redesign their features. So, what uh, I'm going to explain next is, uh, so I'm going to componentize a typical API management platform. So a typical API management platform would have certain components. Uh, it would have a, a portal where API developers can log in, and it would have a portal where application developers can log in, and it would have the gateway runtime, which is a very important part. And uh, what we are going to discuss is what each part, what each component has to offer for GraphQL APIs in order to successfully manage GraphQL services. So first we're gonna look at the API developer portal. So API developer portal is a, a portal where API developers log in. So this could be your organization's uh, employees. Uh, they log into this portal and create APIs. Some would already have experience on it. Uh, so 
we are going to discuss what this API developer portal has to offer in terms of GraphQL APIs uh, to successfully manage them. So the first thing is we saw that uh, a GraphQL API has a GraphQL schema. So this is called the SDL file, the schema definition language file. So the API developer portal has to have a capability to import a GraphQL schema and create a GraphQL API. So uh, this is what we have shown in this screenshot. So this is actually the WSO2 API manager. Uh, so all the screenshots that are to follow are taken from the WSO2 API manager. So once uh, we choose this option and we import a GraphQL API, then the next step would be to show or list down all the operations available in the GraphQL API. We saw that in the previous GraphQL demo, we saw that we can check the lift status, the trail status, so all these are operations. So, uh, you know, also we have to know whether they are query mutations or subscriptions. So, uh, a UI which lists down all these operations and categorize into each category uh, is a handy feature to have in an API developer portal. So the next ability, to, ability is to view it, view the uh, GraphQL schema and also to download it. So why this is important is because uh, this API developer portal is a shared space. It's not just a single person who logs in and creates the API. There could be several people who are managing APIs for your organization. So you might have had the access to the GraphQL schema definition file and you would have imported it and created the API. But now another person would be interested in order to see what schema was used to import this API. So uh, that is why we think that uh, the API developer portal should have these kind of capabilities. Right, so setting a uh, suitable rate limiting policy for operation. So if you have a managed restful APIs, usually these API management platforms provide support to set a certain rate limit per resource. So if you take a restful API, if it's a get users, you could say that it allows only 100 requests per minute, or if it's get something else, uh, only 50 requests per minute. So how do you map this feature in order to uh, GraphQL APIs? In GraphQL APIs, you don't have multiple resources. It's just a single resource. So how do you now map uh, this idea into GraphQL APIs? That is to provide the capability to set rate limits per operation. So what it means is uh, if you want to, if I take the previous example, if it's lift status, only 50 requests per minute. Uh, if it's a uh, trail status, only 100 requests per minute. So something like that. So for GraphQL APIs, setting rate limiting policies only with uh, a quota based uh, a number of requests per minute is not sufficient. We will discuss that, but actually it helps at least a bit. So you could uh, have a capability, something like this. The next capability is to set uh, authorization levels per operation. So uh, similarly, the, uh, if you take again a, a normal REST API, it would have read operations and write operations. So if, you, if your organization has a use case where only certain people are allowed to use read operations and a certain, oper certain set of people are allowed to do write operations, now how do you uh, handle this uh, permission permission capability. So that is usually handled via auth2 uh, auth scopes. So now when it, uh, when it comes to GraphQL APIs, you cannot do this because it's just a single resource again. So again, you will have to map it to operation per, per operation. So you could uh, choose the query, query operations and set, set a certain scope uh, to that. And you could choose the mutation operations and set a certain scope to that. And then you can make sure that particular scope will be issued only to a certain set of uh, users. Uh, 
Uh, the next thing is about uh, enabling and disabling security for each operation. So you could see on this image, I have disabled security for the film and person operation. And what it means is uh, those two operations can be executed without a valid token. So you don't need to be authenticated in order to uh, uh, perform those operations. So this could be a, no, a use case in your GraphQL APIs. So with an API management platform, which supports this level of uh, uh, granular authentication uh, mechanism, you could achieve this use case. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Yeah, when you mentioned about the authentication, is that meaning the access token is actually can be uh, right removed when you remove the security enable? Yeah. So, uh, so if you take a, if you take REST APIs, we have this feature where uh, for resource endpoints, you could disable security of a particular resource. What it means is you don't need to provide the access token at all to invoke those, which means we okay. won't. So in, in terms of the analytic, is that oh, this will be recorded or not? This will be still recorded, but uh, because there is no authentication token, we are not, uh, we, it's, it's not possible to identify what user invoked it, what application was it. Uh, these things are not possible to identify. So analytics is still recorded, but it will be mentioned as unknown. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah so we'll have a Q&A session uh, after the uh, uh, session, so we could uh, discuss anything else you want. Right. Okay, uh, previously I was discussing uh, about this depth and complexity problem which GraphQL has. So uh, how, how, how do you protect it, uh, it, it depends, uh, you, you could choose various mechanisms. There are actually GraphQL backend libraries that do uh, pro provide these capabilities now, but uh, uh, we would argue that it's better uh, if you could do it in an API management platform which supports it. There are certain API management platforms that already support it, uh, including us. So uh, now the problem here is uh, if an API management platform provides this capability where you, uh, where you can block a certain uh, incoming API call depending on the query's complexity. Uh, actually, the API management platform has to know about the incoming query's complexity. So how does the API management platform calculate the incoming query's complexity? Because it doesn't have any idea about it. So this, uh, this can be done if and if in an API developer portal, if we provide a capability where you could set certain complexity values for each operation of field. So this means the runtime of the API management layer can then check, uh, calculate the incoming query's complexity and block or allow the call. So uh, a functionality to set these uh, values can be a very good feature to have in an API developer portal. All right, so that's done now. That's what we discussed was, uh, what, what are the features which are useful for API developers? Now let's move on to application developers. So that is, those are the group of people who come into the API management platforms in order to consume your APIs. They subscribe to APIs and they use it in their applications. So, Usually, uh, you would have another portal where application developers can log in. So in this portal, uh, there would be lots of APIs out there. There would be REST, or GraphQL, SOAP, and all those kind of APIs. So usually, uh, if a particular person is interested about GraphQL APIs, there should be a mechanism for them to filter out all the GraphQL APIs out there. So it's most of the time, a person who is implementing uh, an application and planning to use GraphQL APIs would always try to use uh, GraphQL, all, uh, GraphQL APIs in his application. So there should be capability to filter out these GraphQL APIs easily. Uh, so similar to, um, uh, similar to the API developers, uh, how they were able to see the operations available in the API, 
you could uh, use the uh, you could have a similar functionality for application developers as well and again a download graphql schema uh, option would be handy okay i think uh, so this is i think one of the most important feature to have in an application developer portal so when we started uh, graphql uh, api management uh, in wso2 uh, starting from version 30 we actually did not have this functionality so what we had those days was we provided the swagger console the swagger ui which you might have seen so that is the default tool that we provided in order to try out graphql apis as well but soon we realized that uh, this actually is uh, not user friendly at all because uh, once you expose a graphql service through the graphql uh, through an api management platform through wc api manage in this case you lose all these uh, try out tools capabilities so then we came up with the this uh, we integrated a tool called graphql so in the previous example uh, in the snow tooth api example what we saw was the graphql playground so that is also a graphql tryout tool so similar to that this what you see is the graphql uh, tryout tool so this also provides all those capabilities that you saw on the graphql playground it shows you the documentation and it gives you auto complete and uh, all these functionalities are available in graphql tool as well so the person who is trying to use graphql apis should be able to use some kind of uh, graphql specific tryout tool still it doesn't have to be graphql or graphql playground that could be various other tryout tools but the idea is that you should give the uh, graphql graphql experience uh, to the uh, application developers so uh, one other uh, one other functionality we uh, integrated recently was uh, so usually usually this graph graphic ql does not show uh, any other, so it just shows the prettify history and explore options but you could also see that there is another option called the complexity analysis so we when we introduced the complexity analysis feature where we showed in the pre, in uh, one of the previous slides so once uh, once an api developer sets a particular uh, particular complexity values for each field now uh, when the application developer comes in and tries it out and if it fails if the api is not allowed to uh, uh, be routed to the back end because the complexity is high uh, he he won't have an idea on why how why it was uh, complex like what were the complexity values so we integrated this complexity uh, value ui to the graphql tool so that the application developer can see the assigned complexity values as well so he would have an understanding uh, when he is trying out the graphql uh, apis all right uh, next administrators so again this is related with this rate limiting uh, idea that we have been discussing related to maximum depth and maximum complexity so an administrator should be able to set policies which allow allow certain max depth and max complexity combinations so what this means is uh, a, an administrator can create a policy called bronze and he could have a maximum depth of 100 and maximum complexity of 500 and so on then he could create another policy called silver and he could have a higher values for those so he could give those options to the api developers and the application developers so uh, an administrator should have the capability to create these kind of policies so uh, one other thing here i would like to say is that once uh, we we have a feature like this this can be also monetized in a way like uh, if a particular application requires more complex queries to be executed then they have to subscribe to a higher policy so that could be a use case where you can monetize uh, uh, monetize this all right 
we completed the UI part. Uh, now is actually the runtime, the gate we, we call it in the API management platforms. So no matter uh, if you have all these features, uh, the gateway, if the gateway cannot enforce these things, then uh, there is no use. So usually uh, uh, most of the gateways are designed to uh, designed to perform this authentication, authorization and rate limiting per uh, resource type. So we, in WSO2, we had to redesign all these things in order to match GraphQL operations. So your gateway has to have the ability to uh, perform these functionalities like authentication, authorization, rate limiting per uh, operations. And the next thing is uh, depth analysis and complexity analysis. So we saw that we gave a UI to assign complexity values, and then we gave a uh, uh, a UI for administrators to uh, specify the max depth and complexity values. So now the gateway should be able to uh, look into the incoming query and analyze it, analyze the depth and complexity values of it and block or allow the call. So that capability should be available in the gateway. So another cool thing to have is subscription support. So uh, subscription support actually uh, in the, we do we in WC2 API manager still we do not have the subscription support in the gateway. So uh, if your service if your service has a subscription use case, if your uh, GraphQL schema has a subscription use case, then the gateway should be able to uh, provide the uh, subscription uh, uh, subscription capability as well. So we are planning to integrate this very soon. But uh, uh, this is also a very uh, useful feature to have. Okay. Uh, right, then analytics. So analytics, we talked about how uh, we can uh, do operational level analytics. So uh, if your analytics platform can show charts and counts uh, based on the operations, executed, then it means that the analytics analytics features have been designed in a way to support GraphQL APIs. So this could uh, help you to identify time consuming operation. For example, if if you ask for a particular operation, it uh, the latency is fine. And if you combine it with another operation, now the latency is going up. So you, you know that we have to look at, we have to optimize. So, uh, and also then about uh, retri retiring unused operations. If, uh, <coughs> if there are analytics uh, available, and if you see that a particular operation uh, field is not being used at all, then that would be a good indication for you to maybe retire those uh, uh, fields operations. So these are some screenshots uh, from the uh, WSO2 API manager analytics. You could see, uh, this particular latency graph is when there are two operations, like countries and languages, when both are involved, the uh, latency distribution is as follows. So if you re you could remove one of those operations and see then how the latency is uh, with a single resource. And this shows a screenshot of uh, a combination of uh, operations, the count based on combination of operations. If you have countries and languages, you have got five, five API requests with countries and languages, and only with countries, you've got uh, three requests. Right, so we have uh, come towards the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, so let's try to summarize this. So we discussed what GraphQL is, and uh, we saw how it can be used. Uh, so we actually haven't uh, haven't discussed what GraphQL haven't discussed everything what GraphQL has to offer. There are so many other things in the GraphQL specification that I haven't even discussed. There are uh, fragments, uh, directives, and uh, new, uh, unions, interfaces, and so many other things. Uh, so uh, try to uh, so re read on them and try to see whether uh, those features can be used in any of your use cases. But 
but the summary is uh, that uh, it can be a good choice uh, for APIs depending on the problem that you're trying to solve. So it's not a silver bullet that it's, it can, can be used for all types of uh, problems. So understand the problem that you're trying to solve, understand the uh, system constraints that you have, and then uh, maybe uh, pick and choose the right style of APIs. So we discussed what API management actually means. Uh, so API management uh, is actually a common requirement for all types of APIs, irrespective of what protocol it uses, what language it has been implemented. So it can be, uh, it can be a very useful uh, platform for your organization if you have multiple uh, services talking to various applications. So we discussed uh, how GraphQL APIs can be exposed even via traditional API management platform. So, uh, but then what we realized was uh, in order to successfully reap benefits of GraphQL APIs, the API management platform actually has to uh, treat these GraphQL characteristics specifically and redesign most of the features. So that, that is what I have uh, shown in all those uh, screenshots that what we had to redesign. So the takeaway point here is to, if, your GraphQ, if you have GraphQL services in your organization that you are trying to expose or manage via, uh, via an API management platform, uh, try to look for these uh, features uh, because uh, uh, only with uh, the, these kind of features that you could uh, reap the maximum benefits. This, so this might not be the full exhaustive list. There could be various other GraphQL related features that you find in interesting and useful as well. So uh, I hope that uh, this was an educative session and you were able to understand what we meant when we said <clears throat> GraphQL API management and why, it, why it's different from the uh, rest of the API management, but rest of the API management. So now would be the time to ask questions. I guess maybe we have some questions in the chat. So let me see first. Yes, yes. Actually, uh, uh, it's in the roadmap, and we are we are planning to integrate in the next uh, immediate release. We are planning to integrate GraphQL subscriptions because I don't think it's going to be difficult for us because we already have WebSocket support uh, within the W3 API Manager. So we are trying, uh, we are thinking of a way to uh, make use of the WebSocket protocol uh, so that GraphQL subscriptions can be supported uh, easily. But the, the latest release, the 3.2.0 release, uh, does not support it yet. Okay, uh, so so sorry about it if I didn't uh, if you didn't know about the question. So the there's a question saying GraphQL subscription is not supported for the moment. Is this something in the WC2 roadmap? So the answer for answer was for that question. Right? Do you support versioning and of API and how? Uh, which gateway you use under the hood? Okay, there are several questions uh, uh, from the same person. Uh, okay, uh, the first question is, do you support versioning of API and how? So API versioning was always there uh, in, in the API management, in WC API manager. So you could create an API and uh, then you would have a button which you say create a new version and then you put in the new version name and then it's gonna copy the existing APIs, uh, all the properties of the existing API and create a new API. So now you have two APIs uh, of the same API. Let's say it's API X version one and API X version two. So that capability is there. But uh, so in GraphQL APIs also, it's, we, we are not going to treat, uh, so in GraphQL APIs also, you could technically create new versions. So there, there is nothing that uh, blocks you from creating new versions. But we have, what we have seen in the uh, community uh, is that the best practice GraphQL APIs are not uh, 
not uh, recommended to uh, evolve over versions. You could just use the same version across uh, many uh, many API application clients uh, without actually having to break any client. So uh, the idea of having to have a uh, have versions for GraphQL APIs is very less. So think about it. If that, if you really, uh, why do you want to uh, create new versions? If you happen to create, uh, so the idea is that uh, GraphQL APIs are not uh, shouldn't be a version. So in fact, if you take the Facebook GraphQL API, uh, so far I think they have uh, about thousand client versions still supporting via just a single version. They haven't released even uh, just a new version this last uh, I don't know maybe eight nine years. Okay, uh, so which gateway you use under the hood? So uh, we use something called the Synapse Gateway. So uh, WSO2 Synapse. So this is uh, this is what uh, the WSO and WSO2 Enterprise Integrator supports as well. So this has been our default gateway for uh, for a long time. Uh, so that is what we use. Can analytics be sent to an other analytics engine? Yes, uh, we have we have customers who uh, send analytics to maybe uh, Kibana, uh, Splunk, all these uh, all these other uh, third-party analytics uh, platforms. So uh, that is actually uh, that that can be done, uh, but it requires a, a customization. Does does the platform support caching? Yeah, so WSO API manages uh, supports caching. But uh, caching now, as we discussed, uh, HTTP caching can only be leveraged for REST APIs usefully. For GraphQL APIs, it's it's not it's actually challenging. For so for if your question is for REST APIs, yes, we support caching. Uh, but GraphQL API uh, HTTP caching is not something uh, we are providing. I am new on GraphQL SQL. What do you use to support GraphQL? On the server side, okay. So uh, now, if you are trying to implement a GraphQL API, uh, first you have to understand what uh, what programming language that you are very familiar with. Let's say that you are familiar with Java. Uh, then you have the GraphQL Java impl implementation, server side implementation, which provides all these constructs to easily create a GraphQL API. So if you are if you are familiar with uh, Node.js, then you have the uh, Node.js uh, framework, which supports all these constructs. So uh, first we have to pick and choose what programming language that you prefer, and then choose the there are so there are the reference implementation is actually in JavaScript. So that is what Facebook released in 2015. But if you take now uh, any programming language, there could be multiple implementations from various vendors. So each of these implementations also can have advantages and disadvantages. So I, I would suggest that if you're starting out, uh, may, maybe uh, pick the one that is uh, having mo uh, most of the co community support and then try out a simple API. You, uh, so what I would suggest is just create a schema with just two or three types uh, and try to uh, expose it over the uh, HTTP and try to uh, uh, try it out. So that would be the uh, easiest way to start with GraphQL. Right. Sorry, I miss out the answer on GraphQL subscription, which is similar to the WebSocket. Is this supported currently? Okay, uh, to answer that again, uh, GraphQL subscription is not yet supported in WSO2 API Manager 3.2, but we are considering supporting this in the next immediate version. And that will uh, most possibly uh, use WebSocket under the hood. Because what, in the example what we saw in the Snowtooth example as well, when you were executing the subscription under the hood, the browser was talking to the backend via WebSockets. Because otherwise, you cannot have this single request multiple response uh, pattern. So that's why I said that you need some protocol level support. 
So what we are planning right now, what the plan is to use our existing WebSocket support because we already have WebSocket API management in the uh, in WSD API manager. So since the protocol level support is already there, we are trying to reuse uh, that to support GraphQL subscriptions. Okay, uh, does the platform support rate limiting for different client? Is that a client can perform the query 100 time and client, sorry, uh, yeah, client can perform the query 100 time and client B can perform the same query operation uh, 1000 times. Uh, right, yeah, so uh, the, uh, the example we talked about this uh, uh, co co complexity and debt based uh, rate limiting that actually is a subscription policy that you create. So once you have a subscription policy, each client can go and pick and choose the right subscription policy for them. So each subscription policy supports uh, a maximum depth and maximum complexity value and also a maximum number of uh, request per minute. So client, you could, uh, you could provide uh, 100 requests per minute for client A and uh, 200 requests per minute for client B. All right, yeah. So I think those were the questions and uh, uh, right, I think we've answered almost everything. So if there is anything else we could answer. So Sam, uh, should we wait for another few minutes? So um, if there's uh, no more questions, I think we can um, end. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Right. Uh, so thanks everybody who joined uh, to the session and uh, uh, hanged around until the end of this. So I hope it was an educative session. So uh, if there's any uh, follow up questions, you could please. Uh, you could uh, email me or you could uh, talk to me in Twitter or you could use our Slack channel, uh, which you can ask any type of questions, not only this about this, you could ask any type of question, uh, API management question in our Slack channel, which can be accessed via this link. And you can download our pr product via this link, which is open source free. And uh, then you have these GitHub URLs, which you can use to uh, check our source code and also uh, uh, discuss any issues, create issues, and maybe even to contribute uh, if you have the time. Right. Uh, okay. So thank you, everyone. Uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Adan. Thank you. Thank you for presenting. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.